Hi, everybody. I'm Carolyn Merrick. I am a program coordinator here at the center, and thank you for joining us. Some of you've heard me say this three times, but for those of you who just came in, everybody is muted for this presentation. If you have any questions or comments, you may put them in the chat at any time or write them down. Olga's presentation will be about an hour. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Dubrovnik's so lovely. And uh, there'll be time at the end for questions and answer discussion as well. If at that time I will allow you to unmute yourself so you can either again ask questions in the chat or you can ask them in person at that time. So, uh, oops, let me just let a few more people in and then I'll finish talking. Okay. So let me get spotlight on you, Olga. Okay. I am. There she is. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Olga Chuchkovic. Olga and I met in ex Yugoslavia, where Olga is originally from, 30 years ago. You look amazing. <laughs> you looked amazing then. I always thought you were this mature European woman. Um, you know, that, and to find out we were the same age kind of shocked me because at my age, I was not a tour guide of these beautiful cities. But anyway, Olga is a licensed tour guide in Rome, Italy, and the Vatican City. But again, years ago, she was a tour guide in one of the most beautiful places off the Adriatic Sea that I've ever experienced. And so today we get to go there with Olga. Um, buonasera, Olga, and thank buonasera. you so much. Buonasera a tutti, good evening everyone from Rome. <laughs> but I did spend enough time in Dubrovnik this summer to take some photos, which I hope you will like tonight. So I went back to my, my first love, my city of Dubrovnik. So Caroline, would you like me to, to start, start sharing the screen? Is that okay? So let me see. All right. Looks good? Looks great. Okay, excellent. So this is the most famous view of Dubrovnik and it's called here the title is Jewel of the Adriatic. It's a bit of a paraphrasing of the name it's known under like a nickname, the Pearl of the Adriatic and Dubrovnik has been on everybody's list, especially in the last few years. There have been a lot of cruise ships coming now, well, not this year, but hopefully they will, they will be back. Uh, there was a bit of overcrowding in the city because it's a small ancient city. As you may see, the walls around it that we are going to walk through our visit, they're about two kilometers long or about a mile, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. And uh, about 1000 people live in the old city now, while it used to be about uh, 5,000. Altogether, Dubrovnik has about 40,000 people living in it and uh, most of them, of course, in the modern part of the city. So what we're going to do will be like a little guided tour. We'll enter from the west and then you can see at the far end, I'll try to point it with my cursor here, that is the fortress called uh, uh, Lovrenac locally or St. Lawrence. And that is where a lot of theater performances take place in the summer months. And it's become famous also because it was a, a part of the Game of Thrones uh, um, stages. And a lot of the tourism now is connected with the Game of Thrones. I'm more of the Lord of the Rings generation, but uh, wherever I go to around Dubrovnik now, it's all Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones. And uh, we will walk the wall and we'll also walk through the city. We will visit the museums and uh, uh, have a little tasting of food here and there. And we're looking here at the old harbor of Dubrovnik where those three arches in the middle are now uh, a cafe restaurant, but it used to be like an arsenal where they were repairing their ships. You must know that uh, Dubrovnik was in the past uh, a sort of an independent republic. Uh, there are these two uh, terms that sound very similar and to me, not a native speaker, they're a bit of a problem like suzerainty and sovereignty. So in this case, it was suzerainty because they were always paying tributes. They did have the autonomy within their borders but they were always under some protection, be it uh, Hungarians or Turks later, they were sort of juggling between 
the Mediterranean powers. And they were also under Venetians uh, in the early Middle Ages, so let's say 12th, 13th century until the uh, 1300s, Venetians became their major uh, enemy. Eventually, both Venice and Dubrovnik, both of those republics were ab abolished by Napoleon. And Dubrovnik enters uh, the history of the rest of Croatia and uh, eventually Yugoslavia. Now let's start from somewhere, I'll move from this first, they call it a uh, thumbnail picture. And there it is a bit closer. This fortress to the left is uh, St. John. It's the fortress which now houses a maritime museum uh, worth visiting. And this is the map of Croatia. Although I'm sure you're familiar with the shape and the position, I just wanted to start with some, with some basics. It's like a boomerang shaped state. And what you see in the middle is the coat of arms. This checkered field is a traditional coat of arms of Croatia. And Croatia has become an independent uh, state in 1992. We had, uh, uh, well, the war. Um, 91, 92, it lasted all together for five years uh, at the territory of ex-Yugoslavia. And this black space that you see in the, in the center to the right, that's Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, north uh, west is Slovenia, but we will see the map of ex-Yugoslavia during our uh, visit today. Now, this is the position of Croatia in Europe, very convenient between the continental part of Europe and the Mediterranean. So the capital is not Dubrovnik, it's called Zagreb, and it is in the northern part of, the, of Croatia. Uh, we have gorgeous coast with about a thousand islands, and Croatia has become really, really popular worldwide for beach tourism, and again, cruise ships, of course, but also a lot of people like renting boats with skipper or without, but it's, it's really a beautiful, beautiful nature. And now looking at this map of the Southeast part of Croatia, this red area is what used to be the so-called Republic of Dubrovnik. It wasn't called like that in the past. It was called Ragusa. And there is also a little town in Sicily of the same name. So that may be a bit confusing, but Ragusa was uh, the old name. And Dubrovnik comes from the Slavic uh, Dub, which means uh, an oak, oak forest that used to be on the mainland. And the city was founded uh, around the sixth century, they say, uh, by the Slavs who were, uh, by Slav sorry, by the inhabitants of the Epidaurum, a Greek colony nearby that were running away in front of the Slavs. But the Slavs settled on the mainland and eventually in the 11th century, they filled in the gap, the, the canal and Dubrovnik becomes uh, Republic of Ragusa throughout the history. They start building these walls that eventually ended up as more of a show off rather than a real defense. But because, you know, if somebody wants to put you under siege and conquer, they eventually will most likely uh, succeed. But uh, it was a bit of showing everyone how, how powerful and important they became. So uh, here you see how Dubrovnik uh, looks uh, today. Of, of course, this is not my photo. I took it from Pixabay. There is a site where you can I'll give a little donation to these guys and then take their photos. And this is a lovely drone photo where you see to the right is the harbor that we saw at the first picture. And then uh, all the way to the left, uh, uh, this is a little harbor that is not as uh, uh, important as, I mean, for the, for the ships and for the, for the ferries as the other one, but we will visit that one as well. And we will walk uh, the walls uh, all together. We'll do a lot of things, uh, a lot of things today. And look, this is taken from the wall, the bells ringing from the west part of the, of the wall. And this is a painting that shows Dubrovnik how it was in the past before uh, the big earthquake that uh, took place in 1667. It killed about one third of the population. It was a major 
disaster, uh, obviously, but also the city never really recovered. But let's not forget also that there was after that the event of the steamships. It took some time to, to catch up, but it was a major turning point, not for much better for the for the history of the city and the main street i will try now to show it with the cursor is at the, in the very middle i'm dragging my cursor along the stradone or stradun it comes from italian strada and actually stradone or stradun is a bit of a venetian mocking of dubrovnik like that big ugly street but it's actually we believe the most beautiful street in the world dubrovnik looks really similar at the first sight. There are some slight differences that we won't go into that many details. But if you look at the main street, you will see that the, most of the buildings here on the right hand side of it, on the eastern part, have those uh, porticos, the arches. Well, except for the palazzo or the palace at the, at the far end, sorry, here, all the others were destroyed in the, in the earthquake. So let's go to the next one. Now we have to enter the city. This is a beautiful fortress of Minchata, the big round fortress. We'll get there later. Goes back to the 15th century. Well, this is uh, the Pile Gate. There are two main entrances. This one, the Western Gate, and on the east, there is another very similar, where there used to be the, the drawbridge. And there is a modern, exit to the north, which was drilled through the wall uh, in the 1800s. So originally there were two drawbridges and this is sort of a main entrance to Dubrovnik because most of the traffic comes from the, from the west because of the configuration of the city. And you see here above the entrance, there is a statue of a saint. This is Saint Blaise. Uh, he's the patron saint for the diseases of the throat so on the 2nd of February, we go to the church of St. Blaise and get the blessing of the throat. It's a big feast in the city. He's holding the city in his left hand. He's protecting it. Uh, according to the legend, he appeared in a dream of a monk sometime in the 11th century. And he warned him about Venetians coming over with their ships. And that's how he... Uh, made it possible for the city to prepare the defense against the, the Venetians. Well, they did come under Venetians for a while, for 150 years, but however, St. Blaise is held very dearly uh, by Dubrovnik people. And Libertas, meaning freedom, is the flag of the city. And the, the anthem of Dubrovnik was written by a poet from the 17th century, Gundulic, and it's about the, the freedom. It's all beautiful, all sweet, all precious freedom. And the motto of the Republic was liberty is not sold for any gold. So they were really, really excellent uh, well, spies as well. And that goes with, with diplomacy, but they managed for centuries. They're like a little tiny Republic in the middle of the Mediterranean. And now as we entered the city, uh, this lovely lady, is wearing a traditional folk costume uh, dress from the area called Konavle, the canals, which is the agricultural area in the vicinity of Dubrovnik. And uh, she's selling these souvenirs. So I'm not doing any uh, e-commerce here. I just wanted to, to show you uh, something at the top that says 15 KN. Now what's KN? It's Kuna, it's a local currency. That's about two euro or two point something uh, dollars. And uh, that is the currency that's still uh, in use in Croatia. We did enter European community in uh, 2013, but we still don't have euro as a currency. That should happen uh, soon. And now we are entering the main street. This is what Venetians call ugly. Uh, they are, they're actually envious, I believe. And all the Venice is absolutely striking, but Dubrovnik is very specific. So this is Stradone, Stra Stradun. And uh, to the left are two little churches. Well, one is little, the other one is slightly bigger. It's uh, the first one is of uh, Saint Savior. It's from before the earthquake. So 1500s and survives 1667. The other one next to it was badly damaged. It's the church of the Franciscan monastery. And we're going to visit 
the monastery, while to the right is this really interesting fountain, which used to have a beautiful uh, Gothic flourish, Gothic dome, which was destroyed in 1667, but uh, uh, it was the part of the aqueduct that was built in the 1400s. Uh, uh, it was an amazing project which brought fresh water to the city and the uh, architect was Italian, Onofrio della Cava. Now this is the view from the city wall, the top of the fountain again, the roofs, the main street, the bell tower at the far end, we'll get there, and the bell tower to the left of the Franciscan monastery. Now inside the Franciscan monastery is this beautiful cloister. Uh, we are in the 1300s. The Franciscans came earlier in the 1200s, but this is when uh, they built the monastery inside the city wall. They're frescoed uh, with uh, the scenes from life of St. Francis, who, according to the tradition, stopped in Dubrovnik on the way to the Middle East. And again, the famous painting from before the earthquake. And here is uh, St. Francis receiving the stigmatas on Mount Verna. Now inside the cloister, there's a little museum, but before going into the museum, let me just show you one little detail of these capitals. There are some really amazing ones, little, little beasts, little dragons, typical for the middle ages. And this lovely little figure with his cheek swollen, uh, they say that the architect, Micho Brajkov, had a toothache. So he carved himself with his swollen cheek, poor thing. Now in the museum, there is a little pharmacy. There is an actual pharmacy also in the cloister, modern one, just continues the tradition. But the tradition goes back to uh, 1317. And it is, they say, the oldest still functioning pharmacy, although they might say the same thing in Florence. You know how it goes with the oldest this, the oldest that. But anyway, it's very old. And it's a, it's a lovely little museum where I particularly like these pieces of jewelry. These are votive gifts that the ladies would give to the monasteries uh, either as, as a prayer, as a sacrifice uh, of something that was used to adorn themselves or as uh, uh, grace received. So as a sign of thankfulness to uh, the intercession of St. Francis, of a saint, of God. And these beautiful, beautiful pieces uh, are kept in many monasteries. There are a lot of these votive gifts and uh, I'll show you later, they're at the shops, the goldsmiths and also filigrees that make these beautiful pieces in modern, modern version. I'm sure ladies will be interested. And what is also typical for the Mediterranean area in general, but in Dubrovnik particularly, there are these relics and if you take a look here, for example, the upper uh, arm, there is a little opening through which you can see a piece of the bone and it's supposed to be the piece of the bone of St. Lawrence. So the whole arm was uh, sort of created around a piece of the body of a saint. That was very typical for the Mediterranean. And the Franciscan church has this lovely pieta uh, it goes back to before the earthquake because you see it's, it's Gothic. So it's the, the style goes back in the earlier period. This is late 1400s. And of course, it's very similar to Michelangelo's Pieta, where Pieta in art stands for uh, Mary with the dead Jesus. So we're kind of proud of our Dubrovnik uh, Pieta by a local master. And inside the church, there's plenty of Baroque, but I wanted to show you more so this beautiful piece of mosaic, which is 1900s, uh, a local artist, uh, Ivo Dulcic. He died in uh, 1960. This is a lovely modern mosaic in the old church. Across the street, there is this, across the main street, there is this peculiar window uh, that was the window of an orphanage. And outside at the bottom, there was a sort of a wheel-like structure where people would bring, well, illegitimate babies. And according to Dubrovnik law, and no one was allowed to stop and interrogate a person, usually uh, hooded, 
so they would hide the identity carrying a baby at night. They would safely put the baby on the wheel and turn it around so the nuns inside would take the baby and take care of it around the age of five they would be given for adoption and there were a lot of um, charities like that in Dubrovnik they even had a city doctor so it was uh, for all the citizens they were entitled to this free medical care and the ladies of the night were also taken care of when they became older they would be married to, um, I hope, complacent gentlemen who were probably offered some money by the city or so. They tried to avoid having uh, any members of the society that would be a burden or a shame. And today, this is, um, it's all walled, of course. Uh, it used to be like that. Now, it used to be open, obviously, with the wheel. Now, uh, we're looking at the graffiti, but from the 1500s. It says Pax Vobis, uh, peace on you, memento mori, remember you're mortal. It also talks about people, uh, boys playing ball, playing some kind of an um, Renaissance football where the friars from the probably the Franciscan dormitory were complaining about the noise in the afternoon when they were uh, having their naps. So peace on you, you're mortal too, although you're playing soccer. So talking about graffiti seems that they have always been there in this form or the other. But now the Prieko street with the restaurants, which is parallel to the main street and it's full of lovely little places, very picturesque, uh, little streets. You can walk around for hours just taking pictures of these uh, lovely, corners where everything was very strictly regulated. You can see the straight street means it's really more of a Renaissance than Middle Ages because Middle Ages would be kind of winding. And this is urban planning, which returns with the Renaissance and 14, 1500s already. And the kitchens were always at the top. They were avoiding the frequent fires spreading all over or burning the whole building because the kitchen is where the fire usually starts. And if it's in the if it were in the ground floor, it would burn the whole building. So when you walk through the narrow streets of the old city, you can feel the breeze. So it was all very carefully planned. And of course, no elevators. So whatever is charming is usually not easy somehow, but it's really, really beautiful. This is, a, so a door open, so I try to be discreet. And now one more monastery uh, for today. This is Dominican monastery. Also, um, 1300, slightly, slightly later, because you see here is already a bit of a, a Gothic uh, flourish uh, with respect to Romanesque, which we had earlier in the Franciscan monastery. And there's also a little museum with local uh, school. I don't expect anyone to really know or remember Božidarević, Hamzić, Dobričević, but they're lovely, uh, lovely altarpieces, mainly late 1400s, early 1500s, which was the peak of the power of the Republic of Dubrovnik. And uh, there, of course, there's the baptism of uh, Jesus here in the middle, surrounded by the saints. And uh, uh, below, in the corner, usually, there would be a little figure of the person who commissioned the altarpiece and well paid for it. So they liked to be represented. And one of the most important pieces in that museum is the skull of Saint Stephen, the King of Hungary, uh, who lived in the 11th century and was canonized in the same century, which is usually rare. It usually takes more time for beatifications and canonizations. How did this skull relic ever come to Dubrovnik? Nobody really knows. At least I couldn't, couldn't find out, it just is there. And not just the uh, heads and legs of the saints or jewelry, beautiful jewelry as well, but there are these beautiful pieces with the, well, you can see the bellies and uh, um, hearts and eyes and arms. Well, these are also ex voto gifts for the healing of a certain part of the body, usually for the grace received. 
or you can see also like little babies wrapped or a whole figure you're praying for for someone for whichever reason and these are made of uh, silver they don't do them anymore i only saw them in one little shop in uh, in the naples that still sells them but it's more of a souvenir nobody really does that anymore this jewelry is absolutely stunning so those are more gifts that the ladies from dubrovnik would give to the monasteries they were very, very strict, very patriarchal, and the young men from Dubrovnik could only hope, for example, their, the maximum they could hope from a young lady was uh, uh, when they were singing under the balconies for the joy of the neighbors, then uh, the ladies could throw on them uh, eggs made of uh, resin and wax, but inside was perfumed water. And then they would break and then the young man would take the perfume and the eggs, you know, that was the way they, they courted the ladies or they would show their interest. So they would not really wear too much jewelry. The Dubrovnik people did not believe in showing off of their wealth. And this is another beautiful piece of reliquary with all the tiny little pieces of belongings of the, of the saints, usually a little tiny piece of a bone or it could be anything that belonged to a saint and a lovely Mary with baby Jesus. Now, after two monasteries, we deserve to go to the market uh, and buy some fresh fruit. Uh, this is a bit late, as you can tell. Um, it's not the main market, obviously, of the city, which is in the modern part. It's an open market. There are also supermarkets and everything else, but this is a lovely picturesque market. It's nice to come before 12 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, they feed the pigeons with corn and it's a, like a tradition they know you know they they wait on the roofs a little bit before 12 o'clock you can see them 15 minutes or so they all stand there and wait for the for the bells to ring and they come for their lunch they've been doing that for decades in Dubrovnik and you go there to also buy some fresh figs and uh, grapes to go to the beach and just take with you buy some dry figs if you want to carry them home and have them last all winter. Uh, also, you'll see there to the right, uh, there are the, um, the roasted almonds uh, or the, the skin peels, orange peels in sugar. So little, little snacks, you know, it's not like a big, big market. It's more of a souvenir place, but also there are a few restaurants there is a place which we love a lot, which is sort of an oyster bar, but it's actually a restaurant, but they have excellent oysters. We'll, we'll see more oysters later. They're typical local produce. So here is a, one of the little streets where we all like to go, little cafes. This is a little cafe that was one of the first ones ever open in like from the 70s, I believe. And you have a little grappa, which is actually Travarica, uh, travarica trava means herbs, herb in, in Croatian. And travarica is a grappa made with herbs. And this is a homemade one, don't tell anyone. But that's where we like to do in, in the morning, like a little coffee, a little grappa, just to uh, start the day in a good spirit. Inside are all the memories from local artists. This is for, you know, for people also who may would like to go to Dubrovnik and get the feel and, well, spend some time with the locals, you know, just to see how, well, we don't do anything special. We just have grappa and grapes and, and figs. So uh, Luci was um, the owner, was a member of this band, which in 1969 re represented ex-Yugoslavia at a festival called Eurovision, which is a big deal for all of Eastern Europe. But all the, all the European countries participate, but for Eastern Europe, somehow for us, Eurovision is like uh, Sanremo for Italians. And back on the main street, here at the far end to the right is um, the Church of St. Blaise, the patron saint of the city and uh, the bell tower, which I mentioned a couple of times uh, in the middle of the square, there is a statue of Orlando while Roland, I'll tell you about him, but these two are the little greenies, so bronze men with hammers. These two are in the, in the museum. In the bell tower, we have the, the replicas and they do ring the bell. And uh, they 
are called greenies because they got this green patina and uh, they strike twice. If it's five o'clock, five times. But three minutes later, five times again. And like that every hour because they want to avoid people having an excuse. Oh, I haven't heard the bell tower, so that's why I'm late. No, no, that's why we strike twice. So there's also Saint Blaise. There are a lot of these little guys who take care of us, little greenies, uh, Saint Blaise at the top of the church and uh, Orlando or Roland. In re real life or legend, who knows? Uh, Roland was an eighth century Frankish military leader, but in the middle ages, he becomes a symbol of the free cities and it's called in Dubrovnik uh, uh, Orlando or Orlando with the uh, local accent and he's been under restoration for some time and i just wanted to have a peek at the cathedral of dubrovnik cathedral is where there is the seat of the bishop the cathedral of the bishop there is a really interesting little treasury where i could not take pictures it's just not allowed that holds the skull of saint blaise 12th century skull with enamel with precious and semi-precious stones well he lived in the fourth century but the relic itself is from the 12th and there are many other striking relics in that little treasury but back to the square with the market if these stairs look familiar then you are a game of thrones fan probably or maybe you've seen the pictures of dubrovnik or been there the jesuit staircase the game of thrones it becomes that famous walk of shame and uh, a lot of tourists, when you go there, they're all recreating this walk of shame down the, down the steps. They lead to the Jesuit church of St. Ignatius. They resemble, the steps resemble the Spanish steps in, in Rome. That's basically the same period, early 1700s. And the Jesuit church also uh, is reminiscent of the Gesù, Jesus, and Sant'Ignazio, St. Ignatius in Rome, because of some of the same architects were involved in the, in the project. So it's a beautiful Baroque church. There's also a Jesuit college, a uh, lot of good education. Dubrovnik families uh, cared very much, especially aristocrats. Of course, they cared about the education of their young. Plenty of Baroque Jesuits are the best when it comes to Baroque. And there is also an Orthodox Church, Serbian Orthodox Church in Dubrovnik. It goes back to early 1900s. The Serbs are, are minority in the city of Dubrovnik. There's also a Jewish community. The synagogue goes back to the 1300s, 1352, one of the oldest ones in Europe. And there is a museum and a synagogue, but the synagogue is, all, is used uh, only for the festivities, for the, for the celebrations. It's, it's an interesting little museum. There was a whole street. There was, a, well, unfortunately, but it was a Jewish ghetto and it's called Judioska, Jewish street. Now it's about time to stroll and discover uh, lovely little corners of Dubrovnik. I just love the laundry, as you will notice. So people just live here and they dry the laundry. For the difference of the big cities, it's allowed. And it is, it's not private in a sense. This was just a joke. I just saw that hanging, so I took a picture. Of course, you can walk through. You try to be respectful and silent. So really, really lovely corners. A friend of mine grew up in the old town, so she took me, no, 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 you have to come this way and look through this window and look through that window. So it takes, and then as a kid, we were playing. I didn't grow up in the old city, but she did. So she showed me these lovely corners. There she is, actually, I can see her to the right side, to the right. And uh, uh, this is a 10th century church of St. Stephen. This is when Dubrovnik was uh, under the rule of the Byzantines, Byzantine Empire. And now we're going to have a peek through the wall there are two cafes called Buja, Buja 1, Buja 2. But Buja comes from the Italian buco, which means a hole. They're literally holes through the wall and then you go down 
to a cafe, you can swim, you can have a drink. See the island uh, on the other um, straight ahead? That's the island of Lokrum, where we will go. It's not inhabited, it's uh, under protection. It's like a, like a park. It's not a national park, but it's a protected island. The nature is protected. This is how the cafe looks from the boat, from the outside. You see how pleasant that is. And also strolling and wandering around the part of Dubrovnik. This is now facing not north, the mountain, but the, the sea, uh, the south, the Adriatic. There is a museum called Rupe. Uh, Rupe is also a hole, but in Croatian. Buja, Buko was Italianized. And Rupe in Croatian, the holes, refers to these siluses. There are 15 siluses that uh, contained the, the grain. Uh, the grain uh, in the past was the starch food. And you had to protect it uh, from the mold. And uh, this was uh, like a granary of the Republic of Dubrovnik. We go back to the 1500s, but there were some siluses and the storages even before that. And I could not take a picture again, copyright and stuff of the video. I could not record the video, but I took a picture of the screen where you see how it worked with those holes down in the ground in the rock and they would store the grain, which like that would not be exposed to humidity. It's also an ethnographic museum. See these lovely costumes from the hinterland, the blouses and uh, the jewelry. Again, the beautiful necklaces, typical for the area of Dubrovnik. And also there are a lot of places we can do little tastings. For example, I found this lovely place to taste the um, Croatian olive oil with spices. Although dipping is uh, uh, not Croatian so much or Italian, it's more of uh, uh, before lunch or, or dinner, it's more of an American thing to dip, but we all love it. So uh, how to sell good olive oil? Well, you have to dip into it. And uh, there's, it's one of the 28 Croatian products that came on the list of the protected, the label of excellence. Uh, their origin is protected. So from this area, you produce this olive oil. And it's really important to maintain these traditions to not have things made, made of plastic eventually. And you need a little refreshment, those uh, roasted almonds that you bought at the market. There they are, sweet. And one more museum, I promise, uh, short. This is uh, Rector's Palace to the right. Rector was like a duke, the prince of the Republic, but very particular um, function because he was elected for only one month. The idea was uh, we don't want powerful, corrupt uh, leaders. We only want them to rule one month. He was the first among equals. Uh, during that month, he could not leave. The, the palace, uh, there was a big council and minor council, and there was also a Senate with 45 members, but even the Senate was chosen for just one year. And these were, however, just the noblemen, noble families. And they were very strict in who's noble, you know, the origin of the family and all that. And they admitted a few new families after the, the earthquake because a lot of them uh, died out in, in 1667. And inside the cloister of the rector's palace, it's a beautiful stage for the concerts, the acoustics, just amazing. There's the only monument they ever erected to one person, Miho Pracet. Miho Pracet was a, a very rich gentleman from Dubrovnik, one of the wealthiest ever. And he bequeathed all of his property to the city for charity. Uh, different funds, and he's the only person to whom they dedicated the monument. But you see, not outside, on the inside the palazzo. So no cult personality cult there at all. It's a lovely, lovely museum. We see the furniture, the portraits of the nobility of Dubrovnik, lovely pieces. And the cloister, again, I wanted to show you the, the coat of arms of the Republic of Dubrovnik. And at the top is the clock that shows the time. This is like 10.30. 
31st of January, um, 1808, uh, Marshal Marmon, uh, the Napoleon's uh, general, uh, no Marshal General, he uh, issued them uh, the document abolishing the Republic of Dubrovnik. And then it started again making part of the Habsburg Austria and eventually the Kingdom of Yugoslavia between the two world wars and then uh, Yugoslavia itself until the war in 91. This is the Sponza Palace that survives the earthquake and that's why it's Gothic Renaissance, so the style of the previous period. It was a Dogana customs and inside is a, also a stage for the, mainly for events, it's too small for some sometimes concerts, but usually like literary evenings inside and there's also a room dedicated to the defenders of Dubrovnik you know we were under under siege uh, for months and uh, 300 people died in Dubrovnik in 91 92 and about two-thirds were the, um, uh, the defenders so this is a memorial memorial room and there are a lot of places where you can learn about the history of the war of ex-Yugoslavia and uh, uh, this is how the city looked like. This is how we found it after one major bombing on 6th of, 6th of December. But luckily it came out of the ashes and uh, uh, there it is, a gorgeous, gorgeous city again. So this was from inside of the Dogana Palace. And uh, I just wanted to show you this window. Well, it looks like just any window with the bars and uh, nothing special. But don't forget inside, it wasn't just the customs office, it was a mint as well. So a lot of those coins had to be protected. And if you look closer at these bars, and now even closer, you will see that the rings through which the bars go, that the upper layer, the ring is vertical and the lower layer is horizontal. So it would have been literally impossible to break into the building through that window. So it's like a little, little fun detail from the Palazzo Sponza Sponza Palace. And this is the entrance to the city walls. I promised we would go. There we are. We are above the harbor now and we're walking on the wall, you can do only half of the wall and uh, you can do all two kilometers or a little bit more than a mile. You can lovely, lovely views of the, of the roofs, a lot were restored after the war. And this is the northern section of the wall with the fortress called Minchata, we saw it earlier. So the fortress has become round with the invention of the, of the cannon cannons and cannonballs. So the square medial fortress, they become, become towers, they become very vulnerable, so they become round. And now we are above the Pile Gate where we were at the very beginning. So we are in the west and we'll come back this way to take a look at the fortress of Lovrenac, which is detached from the, from the city. I just wanted to make the whole circle. This is the part of the wall facing the Adriatic Sea, looking again towards the island of Lokrum. Now going back a few steps now, there's this lovely bay with two fortresses. To the right is the famous Lovrenac, uh, uh, where like our Elsinore, the Hamlet, you know, I, I was like a, not really a child, I was a young girl and there would be like Daniel Day-Lewis passing by and Dizzy Gillespie, Derek Jacobi, you know, later Hamlet was played by um, Radu Sherbagia, by Goran Višnić, also our famous actors. But to me, you know, theater is uh, how the city breathes, you know, the whole July and August Dubrovnik Summer Festival is just amazing events. But today, uh, a lot of Game of Thrones. Uh, this is the Bokar uh, Fortress, also 15th century, uh, also connected again with the Game of Thrones. But to get here, you can um, take a kayak. There's a lot of kayaking um, that became popular recently. You can go uh, up to the 
Fortress of Lovrenac if you if you wanted to. It's also open for visits, and there is a statue of Saint Blaise protecting the fortress. You'll meet a lot of people who are there on the Game of Thrones tours, and that's why I wanted to show you the little place. It says the Iron Throne. It's again from the series, and there are two Iron Thrones. One is on the island, and one is here. So if you wanted a picture taken with the sword, you buy a little stuff. Doesn't mean anything to me again, but it's it looks fun. Looks like fun. Been promising myself to watch it. And back to the to the harbor, we're going to take one of these two ships, uh, the more modern one. The other one is a replica of the old. Karaka or Argosy type of the ship that was typical for the Republic of Dubrovnik. But we're taking this more modern little ship and off we go to the island, which is for me a happy place. I just have to go at least <laughs> once or twice when I'm there in the, in the summer. So it ends with, um, on the side, the Fortress of St. John, the Maritime Museum. On the opposite side, on the mainland, there is this very long building with identical roofs. It's called Lazaretti, a Lazaretto. It was a quarantine. Now, Venetians and Dubrovnik, they're contending, oh, no, we invented the quarantine. No, we did. Be it as it may, it was a quarantine. And uh, uh, we go back to 13, 1400s when they already had quarantines in some islands. And the word comes from the word Italian for uh, 40, quaranta, quaranta, 40 days to see if you brought some kind of a disease with you. Now, leaving the old city, you come to the island, lovely little, little harbor. These are these little ferry boats that go every half an hour. And there's a little lake in the middle of the island to, where some of my friends learned how to swim because it's very safe and uh, it's, a, it's a salty water because it's connected with the open sea. There is like a tunnel that you can uh, dive through. I've never managed, but uh, I know it's there. I've seen it. And there is a botanical garden as well. Lovely. There is a historical monastery that was a Benedictine monastery. The Benedictines uh, are the oldest order and they were there until the, the French when they were ordered to leave. The French built the fortress at the highest point of the island and the story goes that the Benedictines cursed the island and anyone who takes it for their own pleasure. So they walked around the island with their hoods and with their candles turned upside down and they left the waxed trail around the island. Needless to say the three gentlemen who brought the, the message from the French. Uh, one drowned, uh, the other one was killed by his servant, the third one eventually committed to suicide. And then it becomes the, the property of the, of the Habsburgs with Austria and Maximilian, the Habsburg, eventually was killed in Mexico. And Rudolf, <clears throat> the prince, commits a suicide with his mistress, Maria Vecera. So a lot of people connected with the island. Of course, these are you know, legends. Uh, so it's, it's a lovely little addition to the atmosphere of the island, but uh, I can guarantee nothing like that happens these days. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to visit. You can spend a whole day easily. There's also a museum, the ruins, the restaurant, and uh, uh, the history is absolutely fascinating. This is the uh, Hungarian, the, um, sorry, the Habsburg family. And this is a lovely bench where Maximilian and his wife Charlotte uh, used to sit, where you see a wider part. That's where Charlotte sat with her big gown, with her big dress, you know, how the ladies used to wear those improbable uh, dresses at that time. This is really one of my favorite corners of the, uh, of the island. And now on the way back, to the old city. Just wanted to show you, Karaka is also coming back from an excursion, the, the ship. It's a tourist ship. Now they do lovely, lovely excursions. It's a ship that's very similar to the Christopher Columbus now, uh, a cargo, uh, Santa Maria della Salute. And it was a typical cargo ship for, for that time. And the 
heyday of the Republic of Dubrovnik they had, which is, let's say, uh, 14th, 15th, 16th century, all the way into the 1600s, they had almost 200 of these cargo ships and they were trading all over the, the Mediterranean, a big competition to Venetians. You can find out about their maritime history at the Maritime Museum. And again, this is a model of the, of the Caraca. Uh, all the way until the 1800s, they've been having these consulates all over the, the Mediterranean and larger than outside of the Mediterranean as well, all the way to uh, Atlantic and uh, also the Scandinavian countries, about 80 consulates. It was a really interesting little republic historically. Now, towards the end of the day, uh, this, is, this is winter and today it's empty, but just love this photo of the beach called Banje outside of the old city, or you may ask the locals where it would be more discreet, uh, not so crowded, lovely little beaches around. This is my beach. This is a uh, Lapad neighborhood. And uh, uh, I used to live just below that hill there. <laughs> hill is called Petka. So again, the beaches and, uh, and the hotels. There are lovely bars uh, like this. Uh, this is already like a twilight. So you may have come back from the beach and uh, you just would like to have a little refreshment. Or you may would like to visit another museum like of the love stories. That's a very peculiar one. Or this one I visited and I was fascinated how well done it was. Now Red History Museum refers to our communist socialist past. We had a soft version. We were sort of in between the East and West Bloc, Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, this is how Yugoslavia looked like. This is from, uh, <clears throat> this is from the museum, the map. You see Croatia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, Slovenia. They're all independent states now after the war. And they recreated everything as it was. You know, I did not really have a bed like that, but my mom had a radio like that. Or a lot of these songs meant something to me. This is from, you know, 60s, 60s into the late 80s. You can listen to them. Also the produce, like, so this is still, you can find Vegeta, we call it like that, Vegeta, the dry spices that our moms used to cook. It was very nostalgic for those of us who, well, are of that age, remembered the good things as well of the, of the past. And now, ladies shopping, the jewelry stores, filigree stores with the lovely replicas uh, of that historical jewelry, beautiful earrings, you know, different earrings, different villages. Each one has a little story behind it. And gentlemen, there are the ties. They say the Croats uh, invented ties, neckties. Kravata, Croata, that's what the game of the words would go play with. Now, what to do for fun? Like we haven't had enough fun yet. I'll tell you later where I found this, this donkey, but uh, you can take the boats to go to the islands. This is a beautiful little island of Shipan that was part of the Republic of Dubrovnik. This is slightly farther away. It's not like attached to the, to the city. It takes some time, like an hour, hour and a half. Or you can go to Ston, a lovely little town, which is like a replica of Dubrovnik, which was protected with this wall because obviously there was something important there. Otherwise you would not build this uh, really impressive wall. Well, they were protecting the salt pans because the word salary comes from salt. Dubrovnik had like the popes in, uh, in Italy, they had like monopoly on the trade of salt. And this is where a lot of wealth was coming from, most of it actually from the salt and uh, they still sell local salt, no additives. It's one of the really appreciated products uh, of Croatia from that area, from stone, from the salt pans of stone. And you can see here in the restaurants, you know, how many varieties also. There is a flair de sol, which would be like the flower of salt, which only takes the, this little uh, skin that forms on the, on the surface with more minerals something like that, but it's more expensive. 
and uh, um, aphrodisiac, I'm not sure about that, but everybody talks about the oysters. And here they're really cheap because that's where they, where they pick them and cultivate them. And when I see them, I smile. And these were like five or 10 years old and it was slightly more expensive, but I was happy that day, really happy. They were more tasted, more like steaks than, than oysters. And wine. Uh, this is the beginning of the peninsula of Pelyashats. Again, this is like everything is within an hour what I'm showing you, uh, except for the first island that we went to. And uh, a lot of great wineries. Dingach, as it says at the top of this uh, um, sign, Dingach is the variety of red wine. But there are a lot of really, really good wines in Croatia now. It has become a thing. But Dingach has always been my favorite, as you can tell. And it's good to wrap your day, uh, wrap up your day after uh, a beach uh, with palacinke. Palacinke are the crepes. I mean, nothing very smart about them, but my, our moms used to make them. You know, with marmalade, with walnuts. Uh, so that's you just mention palacinke to a croat, and you'll make them happy. It's like comfort food to us. And now you go back to your, if not hotel, to your apartment. A lot of people rent apartments, soba, the rooms, whatever you can afford. And you beautify yourself and go out in the evening. We are wrapping up the day and, uh, and the presentation soon, but I'll show you a few more things. How Dubrovnik transforms itself beautifully at night. And you may go for a lovely romantic dinner that's restaurant street or there are a lot of good restaurants you obviously always ask the locals uh, because things change you know I, I try never to really recommend a restaurant until i get really fresh news is this place still good some are like the the guarantees for for decades but um some have to be sort of checked and but there's a lot of good places really i was i was very pleasantly surprised this summer really good food many places and you can Decide also, you might decide to go outside of the old city and take the cable car to the mountain right on, on, on top of the old city I and mean, right above. And there is a lovely restaurant there, but the view is absolutely uh, spectacular. And this is the view of the old city and you see, then the modern part of the city stretches along the coast in the direction of north. There's also uh, a war history museum that you can visit during the day. In the evening, you may come to this restaurant, which is really, really good. And you have to make reservations way ahead. But you can also come just for the, for the view. There, there is viewpoints and terraces and go back down to the old city for a stroll through the harbor. It's all very romantic. And uh, you chase the moon around the walls or you stop for a drink at uh, Porporela. Porporela is, you see, right outside of the Maritime Museum of the Fortress of St. John. My best friend's son is running this place, so um, please go and spend a lot of money. Drink good wine. It's really, really uh, romantic. We like to, to go there. Uh, if, if, if we are that late, you know, that doesn't really happen that much anymore. And uh, this is the beautiful street when everybody has gone to sleep. Uh, uh, this is how the old city look like. It's beautiful at any time of the day. And uh, I hope I managed to transmit the beauty of Dubrovnik. And um, although I live in Rome, I always go back to, to Dubrovnik. I have my closest friends there and it's always going back home. Well. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. As I promised about an hour, but I'm here as long as you want me. Olga, that was wonderful. Wonderful. Um, would it be okay if I stop the share so I can see folks? And mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we have one question in the chat. And um, also at this time, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself if you have any questions or comments for Olga. Um, Madeline asked, do they have large attendances of parishioners at the churches in Dubrovnik? 
Do they have? I did not understand. Large, large attendance. Do a lot of people oh, go to okay. the churches? Well, honestly, there is a sort of a reverse process in Croatia with respect to the rest of the world. Like I live in, in Italy, where there is no that much attendance. But in Croatia, there is a tendency to uh, go back traditionally to the Catholic Church, more, much more so than in the past, obviously. <coughs> I know that a lot of people uh, do all the sacraments and everything. I cannot say um, they go to church like regularly, but I do have friends who do, really close friends. It's not a very high attendance, but let's say that on Sundays you, you would find people in the church and the traditions are very much respected. So like any, any religious holiday is, uh, is really important for the, for the Croats. And I know when there are Croatian groups in, in Rome, they all want to go to these several churches which are connected somehow to Croatian history. So more than you would expect, more than you can see in the rest of the world, I believe, at least, you know, European part. Right, right. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I see a few people have unmuted themselves. Dorothy Richards, did you want to say something? <laughs> How about Losi Wilkinson? Oh, I just loved it. And I thank you so much. My husband doesn't let me travel. My mother, of course, has died that I traveled with. But I just sure hope I can go. It's just lovely. Of course, I know there are, I love tennis. There are several new tennis players from Quake. Mm -hmm. So I was glad oh, to see. Yes. 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 You're big, big on playing tennis. Not me, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> oh, I just love it. Of course, <laughs> not now. But thank you so much. It was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else said in the chat, wonderful presentation. Uh, it sure was. Mm. <laughs> I agree. Um, we'll definitely visit. Where else would you recommend we visit on a trip to Croatia, a city or a region? Good I, would, I would recommend uh, the islands. If, uh, if the sea is your thing, I would say at oh. least like a week on the, on the boat with the skipper to take you between the islands especially around the area of Zadar, uh, Z-A-D-A-R. And um, split mm. is also interesting, but for half a day, I would say, because it has the ancient Roman base where Emperor Diocletian was from, from that area. And he built his uh, Palazzo Palace there, Imperial Palace, which became the old city of Split. Uh, I love the islands. I would absolutely combine the coast with the, the lakes called Plitvice. Uh, Plitvice, P-L-I-T-I-C-E. Well, you saw, you saw my, my name, Olga, Rome. It's also my site. So if you have any questions that you may think about even later, I'll be happy to, to answer, just mm -hmm. to mention before I forget. But the, the Plitvice is a national park of 16 lakes. It's mm -hmm. more like north of Dubrovnik. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely, absolutely stunning. And the capital, Zagreb, it's a typical little middle European place. And um, I love it. I also go there every winter to visit my friends, but you can live without it. It's kind of cute. If you would like to just feel the middle European, middle European tradition. But I would say if you have to choose, I would stick to, to Dubrovnik and to the islands and Plitvice lakes. Not any likes. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Olga. Go ahead. Hey, this yep. is Liz Marshall. I that was just wonderful. Wonderful. And Thank I you. need to tell you that I I too have had Palachinkin because all my grandmothers are um, Croatian. Oh. Whoa! Oh, and yeah. their last name yeah. you will like this. Oh, okay. I know. Cheers! 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 Yeah. And their last names were Kozaritz, Karlovitz, yeah. and Galowicz. <laughs> Where were they from? Well, they um, they ended up living in Austria, so they were in the Burgenland. But their yeah. families then came from Croatia, oh. and my my dad spoke Croatian until he was five, and finally went to kindergarten in the United States. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, but he would always say "Hodi jis, Hodi jis." Does that mean hurry up? Hurry up. Hi, hi, is like. Uh, Pojuri is go faster, hurry up. 
<laughs> maybe my dad was saying something he didn't want me to know about. <laughs> or maybe, maybe he was also speaking some dialect that happens. Oh, it could sometimes. very well be, yes. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. That was well, just you could, you write me. You tried to write it down as you remember it. So I <laughs> would have no idea how to start. How do you write it? Yeah. Whatever well, it always. sounds to you, whatever it sounds like to you. <laughs> That's so great. That is so great, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like this. We have connections all over, don't we? <laughs> it's true. It's true. Malachinka connection. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, a woman named Maria said that her grandparents came from Yugoslavia, so it's nice to see this. Um, yeah. A lot of people, lots of thank you, thank you, wonderful. Brings back fond yeah. memories of my visit to the city. Oh, I'm not really Let's see. Maybe the center can plan a trip there. I will definitely. Oh, that would be great. I'd do it then. Um, someone asked, how many languages do you speak, Olga? <laughs> um, uh, three and a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know what the quarter is. What are the three? I don't know the quarter. No, the, quarter the quarter is Russian. Oh. But uh, I worked with Russians. I had uh, this basic Russian education when I was a kid in um, elementary school. <clears throat> so until the age of 14 and then the first year of the middle school. And then we moved from, from Pula in the north uh, along the coast to Dubrovnik and there was no more Russian at school. So I was the, the only uh, freak of the nature who at 18 spoke some Russian in the city where nobody, except for one or two guides. So when I when I started working as a guide, I actually first they asked me, please do a Russian. I said, my Russian is like this little, you know, it's a quarter. Because we don't care, you know, one of the ladies is pregnant. So when she comes back, you can go switch back to English. And it was quite traumatic. I was 18 and I was scared, but uh, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to learn it again because again. i love the language but i i understand a lot it's a slavic language but i cannot say i speak it and well i hope i speak decent english and i've lived in italy you sure for, did. yeah thank you and i've lived in italy for 30 years so uh italian has become actually my second language uh. more so than than english but less formal background but i'm trying to not make mistakes and not tell italians always you guys, you know, I just learned subconjunctives and whatever complicated yeah. thing you have, and now you stopped using it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! For me, Clay, would you want to say anything here? I see. Oh, uh, it just was wonderful watching Olga go home to friends and food. Oh! Uh. <laughs> I saw oh. those oysters. <laughs> oh, I just would love it. Mm. Wonderful. They were wonderful. Guy Brown says, thanks for bringing back wonderful memories of when we were there in 2004. Great presentation. Yeah, lots, sure. of, yeah. lots of that. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. You. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else? Any questions or comments? Uh, great. Well, if you want to see this again, or if you miss this, or if you have friends who you'd like to share this with, Olga has graciously said that we could post this on our website. Um, so we'll do that. Um, it, if you, um, it, it will take a little while for us to edit, but um, that will be there. So you can Thank watch it you. again. Thank you. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, we have a YouTube website and oh. if you're not sure how to do that, just either call the center or email me, Carolyn at the center and uh, we'll make sure we have a lot of, we have two other presentations that Olga did. And I'd like to put a plug in for Olga, why don't you tell us what you're going to be doing next for us? Uh, we are planning for the Gallery Borghese. Gallery Borghese is, well, Dubrovnik, this was a sort of an exception for me. I started doing presentations on Rome, as we did with Caroline, the panoramic tour of Rome and the Sistine Chapel. And then my friend said, why don't you do Dubrovnik? I said, but I, I, I don't I do Dubrovnik. So here we are. So I spent days going around and okay. taking, taking my pictures. My goodness. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad they, they, well, they were just joking, but you said, hmm, you know, I took it seriously. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but I continue with, with Rome because that's, that, that's what I do. And uh, the next one will be the Gallery Borghese, which is one of the really most beautiful museums uh, uh, in Italy and in Rome, definitely. And it's sort of a, 
uh, on human scale, because the Vatican museums are something you would really, it's, it's overwhelming, it's enormous, and it takes a lot of planning and, uh, uh, and many hours as well, if you want to see it properly. But the, the Gallery Borghese is the condensation of uh, Bernini, Caravaggio, the, mm, the history of collecting of the papal families and how they became so wealthy and a lot of a little gossip behind the collections. There was this cardinal who was the Pope's nephew and the papal nephews would become the favorite nephew would become the secretary of the state and like a prime minister basically. And this cardinal had a penchant for art and put together absolutely amazing collection of ancient pieces and for and what was for him contemporary. So we're talking about Caravaggio and, uh, and Bernini, the most famous artists of that time. No Middle Ages, no Michelangelo, but you know, we jump from ancient Rome, Greek Roman to, to Baroque and uh, the realism of Caravaggio. And it's absolutely stunning. Um, the Camillo Borghese, one of his, uh, uh, not descendants, but of the family descendants, married Napoleon's sister, Paulina, and he sold more than 400 pieces to Napoleon. And they're basically, those pieces are the core of the ancient art collection at Louvre. Mm. But it's, I, I believe it's really, really worth it because uh, the, the, the art is absolutely stunning. And I had about 850 photos, <laughs> which are reduced like here to maybe 170, 80. And sure, my goodness, but even that's- Please, yeah. please <laughs> It's great. It's quite amazing when Olga took me there. I think Olga, you said um, this is where you see marble fly, and I didn't know what you meant until I saw what the artist did. I mean, it's unbelievable. I I never knew there such art existed, and it is such a beautiful setting. So I'm so looking forward to that one. That one is uh, February 18th. Mm -hmm. So mark your calendars and uh, it is already on our website, but we will also put it on our e-newsletter closer to the date. So great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Anybody else? Thank you for today's presentation. Mm -hmm. Look forward to the next one. Beautiful. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, there's no bad comments. Sorry, Olga. There's no um, uh, bad feedback for you to how to improve. Pitch so. it off. Pitch it off before they come. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Yes. Thank you so Take much. Care. Thank you. I'm looking forward to doing more presentations with you, Caroline, and you guys. Always thank a pleasure, you. Olga. Love to see you. you. All right. Take care, everyone. Ciao. No. Or should I say Dovigenia? Yes. You can say yeah. ciao next time. <laughs> okay. Dovigenia. <laughs> How do you say in Russian? See you later. Bye. Uh, do svidania. Do okay. svidania. All right. I can't repeat it. <laughs> All right, folks, take care.